Well, Nancy Mace is the daughter of a retired Army general and a retired school teacher and the representative of South Carolina's first district. She's also the National Republican Congressional Committee's representative for the 117th congressional class. I spoke to her just a short while ago. Take a listen. Representative Mace, it's great to talk to you again. Um, we're in uh, this period just before uh, your next big election. You've come through the primary and, and, and well, and you're now uh, running, of course, um, for South Carolina First District coming up. And I guess I'm interested as we talk today about what the most dependable voter out there who happens to be the woman who's over 50 years old is mm -hmm. of all voter categories, the most likely to vote, you know, fi figures out where they're at and can come in. And I'm just interested in how you interact and, and sense and feel um, the priorities of women over 50 in your district. Well, they, they certainly have greater turnout, women voters, and we're also seeing this year across the country more women registering to vote because of the political climate. Um, their, their concerns are very similar to our concerns. And I, I represent a swing district. And so uh, I think that the South Carolina's first congressional district really is a bellwether for the rest of the country. Uh, economic issues like inflation, those are really, that's the number one issue that everyone is facing, including when I talk to women across the district. And uh, Dobbs, the Dobbs decision is another important issue to women over 50. And then also immigration uh, is having an effect on our economy um, and uh, safety in our communities and drugs like fentanyl. I mean, mothers are losing their children to fentanyl overdoses. In fact, just down the road from where I'm sitting today on the interstate, there was enough fentanyl that was discovered to kill 1 million people. And so, uh, you know, and it's also about how we communicate when we're talking to people. I think sometimes Republicans come off as unfeeling and very spreadsheets, black and white in numbers. But when I'm talking to women, I want to share personal stories from other women that I've spoken to or my own personal stories. When I'm talking about jobs, uh, you know, I, I often talk about my own personal experiences when I was raped when I was 16. So women understand that I'm coming from a very similar perspective. I care just like they do. And that has a lot of meaning when you're talking, meaning when you're talking to women who are out there and women who are going to vote. You know, one, one of the people we've spoken to earlier in today's program, Nancy Lamond of ARP, I've known for a long time, and she coined this phrase that I kind of refer to every once in a while, said, you know, we've learned that the future of retirement is work. And, and it raises this interesting, you know, question of how we treat um, our elder uh, citizens who are going to be continuing to work. You know, are we embracing that? or are we demeaning them in the process? Well, and you look at it today with inflation, you've got, you've got people that are, that are retired that are now coming out of retirement because to pay their bills, they have to take up a job, sometimes two jobs. And so it is an issue, especially when we're talking about social security and what that future looks like. And neither side, Republican or Democrat, are really willing to address what the future retirement might look like for people who are going to need it, who have paid in for the entirety of their career and don't know if they're going to have Social Security when it comes time for retirement. And so those issues are very important. And I, I you know, it's uh, I put the blame, put the blame and that responsibility on both sides because neither has been willing to address that as an issue. And it's only gotten worse because of inflation. And I don't put inflation, I don't put it at the feet of Democrats only. I mean, Republicans have been part of running up the debt. Republicans have uh, driven deficit spending. And um, this has been a problem for decades. It didn't start yesterday. Certainly it's worsened over the last year and a half, but it's not like it started yesterday. The spending issues that we have either caused by both parties. Now, just recently, the Social Security Administration has says it's going to give an 8.7% bump in cost of living alliance allowance. It's the largest bump in 40 years in Social Security. Are, are you and your colleagues supportive of that? Well, I think part of it's going to be how do we how do we pay for it too? I mean, we're I think we're all supportive of increases in Social Security, but the problem with Social Security is uh, what is it going to cost in the future? What's it going to cost now to do that? And then how is it going to be paid for? Already there's some debate amongst economists on both sides of the aisles who's going to pick up the 31 trillion dollars in debt that this country has created, um, and making right. sure that when we are making these decisions and increasing Social Security is really important cost of living has gone up far more than eight percent over the last several years but how do we how do we pay for these measures and have the ability to pay for them in the future because if you can't if you go broke uh then that doesn't help anyone and i know for my generation i'm 44 i'm just expecting 
I'm going to have to work that I'm not going to get social security because I don't have enough confidence in what's going on in Washington right now, that regardless of whether or not they raise it or not, that the money will be there when it's time for me to retire. I mean, it sounds, I mean, I, I understand it because I, I think the same way as it sort of sounds pretty bleak, like, oh, will it be there when I finally get to that point? You get your Social Security Administration note saying this is the amount you're going to get. And you just wonder, is this real or not? Mm -hmm. But you do have some colleagues in the GOP tent that are saying some things that are, are fairly um, um remarkable about social security i you know senator ron johnson uh comes to mind saying you know that this should be an annual vote that that this should be brought in and that there are other people you know basically talking about um uh you know a different a different track on social security and i'm wondering when it comes to you know some of your constituents are they hearing that social security is going to end tomorrow is your are, are some of your party colleagues helping to clarify uh, in this or are they or are they creating there is great yeah there is great concern and the the bill the some of the bills as you cited i mean they're not they're not coming up for a vote they're not going to get out of the senate right. i don't expect it to not in this legislative session nor the next one um, but it is a concern and i do get asked about it especially from those that are already on social security that are in retirement and especially from those that had to come out of retirement and work a job or a second job just to make ends meet because the cost of living has gone up so, so much. And so again, this is a place where both sides have to work together on if they truly want to address the issue long-term, but both sides really are, I think, you know, timid and afraid to do that because they're afraid of the consequences uh, of folks that may not like the outcome. But at the end of the day, something has to be done. I don't think it has to be uh, where we're all going to lose it or we're going to raise the age to 80 before you get it. I don't think that's the future either. But with the lack of leadership on the issue and where do we go to from here, how do we afford to continue to pay for it long term for my generation and then my kids generation in yeah. the future? That is a problem. That is an issue that we have to address in anything Republican or Democrat, whatever legislation we end up working on now or in the future, you know, one of the things that government doesn't do well is it doesn't transition. Well, all of a sudden it's like, boom, here's this thing, this idea, this policy, we're implementing it, we're starting it tomorrow. We're giving people time to transition. And so anything that we do, I would say, would not need to be something that's done overnight. Give people time to plan. If it's going to affect uh, future generations, give them 20 years, 30 years to be able to plan for it. But government doesn't think like a business. Uh, you know, they don't think that way. Um, and so but that's one of my biggest cautions is no matter what changes are made to it in the future, if we can get everybody on board on both sides of the aisle is have time for people to plan for their future. And retirement takes decades. It's not a thing that you can't you can't save up for it for 10 years and then think it's going to be there. It's not. It's something you have to save for and plan for over your the entirety of your lifetime. You know, one of the things we're doing in today's program is looking at a set of polls that have gone in and talked to uh, voters over 50, particularly women uh, uh, voters over 50. And they don't really rank elected officials very high. And, you know, a good majority of them come in and think that elected officials are bad at understanding the everyday challenges of people like them. And, you know, and you've mentioned some of these costs of food, costs of health care, costs of gas, a kind of bleakness, you know, so particularly with people on fixed income. And I know it's unfair to ask a, 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 you know, a member of a body with 435 other people, you know, how do we move forward on things like really dealing with inflation or dealing with some of these costs? But I just, you know, I really respect you. And I sort of want to know on your template, what are some of the ways in which we could be credibly dealing with these cost anxieties that elder Americans are feeling? Well, deficit spending would be a good start when we cannot have the, continue to have the deficit spending. And again, Republicans and Democrats alike have participated in this over the last several years, uh, running up the debt, higher taxes. The infrastructure bill last year, for example, created 42 new taxes in order to pay for it. So when during COVID, for example, when the government literally shut businesses down, they still got record revenues. Government did not make any decisions, make the same decisions that businesses had to make about keeping employees or firing them or getting them on um, unemployment or figuring out ways to make ends meet to keep their doors open. The government has never had to do that. And one of the ideas that I have in addressing spending would be to balance the budget vis-a-vis -vis something called the penny plan. And hmm. previous five years ago, you know, before COVID, 
all you would have to do is suspend one penny for every future dollar the federal government was spending. You balance the budget in about five years. And then after that five-year period, you could increase spending by over 10% every year thereafter. And of course, depending on tax revenues, et cetera. But today in COVID, post-COVID dollars, you're looking at five and a half cents on the dollar for every future dollar the federal government would spend in order to balance the budget in five years. And so things have gotten far worse, faster than we could imagine because we've been so irresponsible about how we've gone about running up our debt and having spending that is not paid for. And so uh, that is an issue that we have to look at. Cutting taxes on middle of America for millions of Americans is another way to address inflation. And then one of the third things that we need to talk about is supply chain. Uh, we're still having supply chain issues and getting a better grasp and understanding of how we can improve the supply chain situation and does that mean we incentivize more companies to come out of China, to come back home, or go, to go south to Mexico, Central and South America? You know, there are a lot of ways that we can address this issue, rare earth minerals or access to those. And a lot of people don't know that what's on the line in Ukraine. A lot of rare earth minerals are on the line there. Things that we have in all of our devices, our computers, our phones, neon and palladium, those issues. And so uh, we really have to take a long, hard look at the supply chain, making sure that our processes are not contributing to higher prices. Uh, fuel, especially diesel fuel, I'm talking to tugboat captains all the time right now, and there is a shortage of marine diesel fuel. And mm. again, when the cost of fuel goes up, the cost of goods go up, the cost of food, the cost of bacon at the store, milk, going to the gas station, all those things. And and women are right. The women that you're, you're looking at the polling, Washington is largely out of touch with everyday living, everyday expenses, that real Americans have to uh, have to encounter that encounter every single day in my district in a certain town in my district. If you're going to rent an apartment, a three bedroom apartment, month to month, it's going to cost you five thousand dollars a month. And I'm like, where's that money going to come from, right? right? And wages can't keep up inflation. And so, just a few things that I would do that that is a trajectory that I would hit if I could wave my magic wand and make it all happen. That's what I would do. Part of the increase in gas prices. Uh, in the United States and around the world is because, in my view, Russia has weaponized energy. There's a crisis going on in the world, and OPEC just made a decision to cut 2 million barrels of oil production um, a day. Do you think, I mean, th this is not normally part of this conversation as we yeah. talk about elder Americans, but it is, it is out there. And I'm interested in what you see by way of the foreign policy connection to this. Should we be tougher with Saudi Arabia? Should we be tougher with OPEC uh, than we have been? We should. And we look what the cut OPEC has done. Gas prices have gone up. I'll tell you, cybersecurity, you won't believe this, but cyber issues also affect gas prices. So two summers ago, uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, a, a company called Colonial Pipeline was hacked. That's when gas prices here in South Carolina started to go up. And then they never came back down. And so there are a lot of different contributing factors. Also regulatory policy, not just federal, but state and local policy towards energy independence also negatively impact gas prices. And so like in the state of New York, for example, it was cheaper to import dirty oil from Russia than it was to use you know, oil and gas here in the, in the United States. And you know, a lot of people harp on the, the pipeline issue, but pipelines are a lot cleaner than moving ga natural gas via vis -vis any other means. And you know, we all want to transition to greener energy, but we, you know, there's, again, you can't just do it overnight. You got to have a plan that transitions industry, uh, both in commercial and residential, uh, that transitions our country over to have a stronger electrical grid, for example. Um, but we have enough natural gas to power all of Europe out of, out of the state of New York, just one state alone, out of the state of New York, there's enough natural gas to power all of Europe for the next 150 years. And so we have an abundance of resources here that we could utilize in the meantime until we're all on solar or wind or uh, you know, battery operated vehicles, all the things that we all want to do and support. But again, it's just having time to transition and working smarter, not harder. You're looking at California now. They're looking at implementing uh, nuclear energy because they've got a huge energy crisis. And they've told people, hey, don't, you're not going to be allowed to power, you know, to buy uh, gas powered vehicles, but also we don't want you charging your EV. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so again, it, it just, let's have a plan to transition. 
and, and uh, work smarter, not harder on the energy issues as well. It's all there. It's all right in front of us. If we're well, willing. Representative Nancy Mace, like I've said, you know, these, these domestic issues are often connected and have international dimension. You just, you just made that very, very clear. Representative Nancy Mace of South Carolina's first district. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.